conflict and resolution in archaeology. Uh, it's specifically on a case study um, of uh, an unfortunate incident where uh, archaeology or an environmental impact assessment was highly contested by various parties, um, and it resulted, unfortunately, in a lot of uh, negative media attention um, and quite uh, shone, shone archaeology in quite a bad light, both locally and the framework in which it exists. Um, Sorry, to go back, the, the, the development in question was uh, a reroute of a highway, um, reroute of a highway corridor um, over a, quite a sensitive area. It's called Camp Coldwater. And uh, it took place actually in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I'll explain in a minute why I, uh, I decided to, uh, to look at uh, an example so far in the past, really. Um, but this is sort of my high level aims of the research were to essentially um, uh, highlight what the issues were. Um, analyze the, hi uh, the, the issues in, hi in, in hindsight, because I think this retrospective thinking is, is kind of uh, really useful, um, and we kind of don't often do it in our workload. We're often, uh, at least in, in my, my area, once you finish with a project, you kind of move hurriedly on to the next, and you don't really take that time to stop and think about what maybe could have been d done better and sort of make the process more efficient. Um, uh, highlight the lessons learned, obviously that's an important one. Um, and as, as we'll see as, as, as the, this all goes on, uh, the advances in some of the theoretical, practical and technological um, uh, realms that, that we're seeing now in comparison to just, just 10 or 20 years ago and how that can help um, communicate it to the public. Um, and I thought it was quite a good conversation or, or a topic to talk about because um, it's in global profession. The theme of you know, this, this, this conference is the global profession, so it's nice to analyse situations where it's not just in the UK and maybe learn something about um, the framework of archaeology in a different country. Uh, so as I said, this is, this, um, I want to highlight this uh, case study because it was uh, quite an extreme example. Um, it brought lots of negative media attention, um, and um, part of the, the reasons for this was because of its complex history and where it was located. Um, and just to highlight, archaeology and environmental impact assessments never really take place just in the, the remit of archaeology or in a vacuum. It's political uh, issues um, come into play as well. So where are we talking about? Uh, the Midwest in the USA, I did, uh, my graduate degree out there. Um, specifically the state of Minnesota, um, based in, uh, in Minneapolis, in the southwest of the state. As you can see, it's on the confluence, uh, confluence of the two rivers. The Mississippi come, comes, comes down and goes off uh, eastwards, and then you've got the, um, the Minnesota River, which kind of goes off that way. So, archaeologically speaking, I think you're thinking right away, you know, there's something there, potentially. <laughs> um, it was the uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation um, that planned the reroute. Uh, uh, sorry, it was the state agency, the Minnesota Department of Transportation, that uh, planned the reroute um, through the area. Um, it's not a federal agency, um, but it did have federal funds. So, um, as we'll discuss in a second, it had to follow certain legislation out in the USA. Um, but it went through this uh, important area uh, of Camp Coldwater. It was very close also to Fort Snelling, which is sorry, is my wire going to go wrong enough? Which is um, located just on the other side of, of, of the joining of the rivers there, and that's, a, that's a quite a major historic site, which is heavily protected. Um, and Camp Coldwater itself uh, had this quite important, uh, or, or arguably important site within it, um, Coldwater Spring, which was uh, high valued by the, the native and indi uh, indigenous populations there. Um, and as I said, the construction was met with a kind of a plethora of opposition, which we'll go into in, in further. Um, this was the original route of, the, of, of Highway 55, it connects downtown Minneapolis to the airport. Um, it was planned to kind of go a little bit further uh, towards the river here, towards the Mississippi, um, and cut straight through the sensitive area. So about the legislation, because as I mentioned before, it, it, it had federal funds, um, so they, they have to implement the 106 processes. Um, this is part of the National Historic Preservation Act, um, made back in the 60s, and it's kind of similar in a sense to some of the historic elements of the NPPF here in the UK. Um, in, in, in the United States, you have to take into account the effects of their undertakings on historic properties, their, them being the, uh, the um, state agency. Um, there's kind of numerous types of, uh, of the historic properties that are included in this covers, including archaeological sites, um, buildings, and then this one that we'll come on to in a second, traditional cultural properties. Um, uh, and this is not just, it's kind of not great wording on anything, historic property, because it does include things like, um, down here, artifacts, records, and material remains that are related to and located within such properties. Um, but what it does um, have is, is, is useful. These have these bulletins, kind of like guidance that we have here, which tells you how to assess um, what to look for, what to include, um, and how, essentially, it can be placed on the uh, National Register of Historic Places. Um, I think I mentioned here. Um, yeah, what, another key point I wanted to point out here was that um, in, in, this, in the States, it's, 
kind of like designated sites here, the, 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 the list of the registers of historic places, but it's not just being on it that gets it protection, it's always also being eligible too. So just because it's not necessarily on it, it still can have the same um, protection if you define it as eligible to the National Register. So, uh, yeah, so the, the Minnesota Department of Transportation um, commissions the work for an archaeological group to, um, I won't mention the names, um, to, to carry out the environmental impact assessment. Um, they carried it out. Um, there was no, they called FOMSI, no finding of no significant impact, and it was declared um, the environment, uh, the, uh, there was, sorry, and the environmental impact statement um, uh, was, was, was carried out without uh, a significant um, finding. Um, Camp Coldwater, and that, sorry, the Camp Coldwater area and the spring was included. Um, there was cons consultation with the State Histor Historic Preservation Officer and the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, kind of consultations, like it's equivalent to maybe local planning um, uh, archaeologists uh, um, here. Um, and there was consult consultation with the Native American group, so the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, um, who inc included the elders. And it's worth mentioning here that 10 tribes were officially contacted um, and no, none replied at this point. So um, that, that was kind of a um, uh, discussion that they have later about what happened there. Um, literature research was carried out, as you might do in an environmental impact assessment report. Um, historic map analysis, they looked at this uh, quite useful map, the Kirby Smith map from 1846. Um, and they carried out a bunch of systematic sampling uh, along the route that the area was going, to, the, uh, the highway was going to impact. Um, this is Camp's uh, cold water and, and the spring specifically here. Um, but I want to bring back to that traditional cultural property um, point where could Coldwater Spring be determined as a traditional cultural property and therefore gain status of being eligible to or on the National uh, Register? Um, and the conclusion was from the EIA that um, it was not uh, worthy of being considered eligible to or on it. And it just didn't qualify for the criteria of Bulletin 38, as we saw go back. That was the guidance about how to define what was it or what wasn't a TCP. Uh, and no, no evidence of archaeological remains was found on this quite, um, you know, as we've seen, quite an important possible area where there's lots of history, um, potentially. Um, uh, so you're just kind of thinking in the background here, you know, they have these words in the legislation that it was, it was an overall good, uh, good faith effort made. Um, was, was, the, what, what was the appropriate research done and the sampling um, done um, to, the, you know, to an extent that you could come up with a robust conclusion? So they've done the EIA, they've done the conclusions, then comes all the issues um, from various parties. Protests occurred, there was lots of um, media attention, um, and then this is the point when um, four of the four tribes spoke up and decided that they thought the area was sacred and that they needed it reassessed, essentially. Um, it's quite, it was, it was quite um, prominent in, in the media at the time in the whole of the states, um, so, so it wasn't good there. Um, and part of the complexity was the diverse range of parties that were involved which were protesting. It wasn't just indigenous communities, it wasn't just Native Americans. It was um, a group of people. You've got these federally recognized Native American tribes, which are um, recognized by the government officially. Um, you've got these other Native American groups, which perhaps claim themselves that they're, that they're a tribe, but they aren't recognized by the government. You've got academic protesters that are involved. Then you've got activists. And you've got private residents, as you do with kind of developments, when, when they're going to get affected. Um, and they all had their own parties. Uh, they all had, each party had their own agendas uh, and goals. So some were there to protect the whole of the Camp Coldwater uh, or wanted protection of it through the EIA. Some of them wanted uh, just the spring to be protected. Some of them were to protect archaeology in general, you know, perhaps the academics more. Uh, um, uh, some were there just to stop the highway construction. Um, some of them wanted the acknowledgement as a TCP, but didn't, but understood that these sort of there's in development, there's these kind of compromises can be made, and then to gain um, some were even there to gain political status. I'm referring here to the non-federally recognised tribes that saw an opportunity to perhaps get federally recognised. Sorry, it's text heavy. Um, so the, I was going to go through each part, just looking at some of their arguments. Really, uh, they argued. Sorry, these are the federally recognised tribes and the non-federally recognised tribes together argued that they had. Um, not really being properly consulted, especially on the topic of intangible heritage and oral uh, traditions, which in the 90s, I guess, was kind of coming to its own. It was, it was kind of a new, uh, fairly new concept and it was starting to be integrated, similar with um, NAGPRA, the Native American Grazing and Reparation Act in 1990. Um, they kind of, there was a few examples. Um, I know that, uh, for example, the Kennewick Man, sort of examples where they're testing the legislation has just come in. Um, 
And they argue that because it's this birthplace of Minnesota, as we saw, it's the confluence of the rivers, really important. Um, should there have been more excavations or sampling taking place, which is an understandable claim, uh, rather than just within the development footprint. Uh, there are these four oak trees which were they argued were sacred, they weren't taken into account in the assessment. There is proof later on that, um, or they had an expert from a tree dating analysis um, done that showed that they were the year, they were 150 years old and they were planted in the year of the Dakota uprising. So their argument was that it kind of justifies again this idea of a TCP, this, this Camp Coldwater area. Um, again, burial lack of evidence. Um, their argument again for that was, well, not all burials were internments at the time. You know, they, they um, often, uh, exposing to elements, uh, having kind of a natural um, decomposition of the body, um, and then not, and they also argue that non-federally recognised tribes were were not consulted as part of the process. Um, but generally speaking, the federally recognised tribes weren't actually that involved at this point, which is kind of interesting because all the protests were revolt were kind of around sort of um, gaining this site as TCP status. Um, not all tribes, uh, but but in sort of in in in. in um, in comparison to that, not all, not all tribes spoke up. So we've got to think of this idea again of the political sort of situation. Um, there were, uh, through my research, kind of became apparent that a lot of them, a lot of the, the, the tribes were having these um, gambling packs, and so they were in discussions already with with the government. So they are kind of picking and choosing their battles. If they didn't get involved here, they might have favour and get these gambling packs, which are kind of de uh, vital to their sort of stability and their income as a, as a tribe. Um, uh, and, and some sort of protection of cold water spring itself rather than to block the highway, which, as we'll see later, is kind of what, what um, was one of the compromises. Um, trying for non-federally recognised tribes to get status, to get that, um, if they get noticed, they get um, uh, see, seen in, in, in this situation, they might, they might gain that higher political status. Um, but unfortunately, a lot, a lot of people that were, um, even, even from the non-federally recognised tribes, carrying out to emphasise their, their sacredness of the site, the undercoat are like um, um, actions, you know, dancing around with feather headdresses on and these kind of things that, that um, I think were, weren't very um, sensitive to, to the situation at hand. Um, regarding the burials, through the EIA that was carried out, the nearest burial that they've documented historically was four miles away. Um, you can see Camp Colt was just north of Fort Snelling. Um, so, th so this is kind of the, their argument. This is taken from a 1906 to 1911 survey, which um, um, could be contested. And then the, ac uh, the academic side of things, that they, they sort, of, sort of looked at, uh, first of all, the sampling methodology, and that they called it, they referred to it as a coffee can study because it's the size of the, of the samples taken out. Um, not really deep enough, not really, um, sort of, uh, not, not many taken, and obviously, we, we kind of know, know now we, we have sort of targeted excavations. Um, not enough uh, investigation is done on the potential of burials, as I already mentioned, and they kind of started high, highlighting the fact that this area wasn't just of indigenous um, value, but there was the uh, sort of the white pre-colonial and colonial um, um, history to it as well. Um, they also mentioned that uh, the historic map of the, the year earlier was actually better and, and, and more um, detailed for the Camp Coldwater area. So why wasn't that um, referred to in, in, the, in, in the assessment? Um, and also the assessment, now, uh, the assessment didn't mention any fine spots that were, were kind of important relating to Native American um, history. Um, uh, not sure why they weren't included, but now we know sort of a quick check of historic environment records that how, how fortunate we are that this stuff's all kind of brought together and that we can easily uh, refer to it when needed. This is an example of the coffee can study, so it was just kind of um, regular intervals um, going down the footprint. Uh, and then we've got the activists and the private landowners. The activists were representing sort of the broader communities. There's an element of friends of Camp Coldwater. Um, they've argued they weren't really taken seriously. They ended up, their voices fell under the radar and it kind of uh, resulted in some lawsuits from them. Um, and part of the legislation says we should seek and consider the views of the public in a manner that reflects the nature and complexity of the undertaking. So um, that they felt that they weren't really um, taken seriously in relation to the complexity of the site. And they've got the private landowners and they kind of joined in. They didn't know how to stop the the reroute and their, their, their only method was joining these protests against why a TCP wasn't, um, wasn't the result of the EIA. Um, but I, I think a really high, uh, important point to highlight as well here, um, they didn't really look at the historic, I mean now we're looking at lots of landscape assessments and stuff, they didn't really, under, I say they, the, the, part the, the, the protest protesters and the opposition groups didn't really look at the possibility of if they wanted it to be a TCP or if they wanted it to be protected to the highest level possible being eligible to or on the National Register. They didn't really think about 
arguing its case in, 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 in the greater landscape and actually making it part of Fort Snelling, which was all pretty protected. Um, you know that that might have been a, a proper route for them had 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 they known. You know had had we communicated and maybe explained some of the frameworks more of the system. Um, but ultimately and, and kind of importantly, like with designated assets here today, they're not doesn't designation um, on the list doesn't guarantee protection. And I don't think that was really um, communicated at any point. And they and, and and some of the groups didn't understand that. So um, they kind of thought that this protest would lead to results of either completely rerouting the highway. Um, um, or not building it at all, which, which might not be the case. So I think that's uh, quite an important thing. So the results of all this, um, how, how does that you know, feed back and affect, affect us as archaeologists um, and the community at, at large? You've got, you've got the cost there and, and the time that's taken to address all these um, um, efforts to, to uh, challenge, your, challenge your assessment. Um, the time obviously taken um, to go back and, and, and confidently argue your case. Um, the resources, massive strain here. Um, 600, just one example, on one night, 600 officers stormed the site um, and had to pepper spray, cut off, you know, officers evicted the squatters and 33 people arrested. Think of the, the cost on that um, just from, uh, uh, you know, for, 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 to the community there. Uh, irreversible damage to the reputation of archaeolo the archaeology group itself, local archaeology and the framework in which it exists. Um, uh, is, is the process correct, kind of uh, um, challenging that? Um, and there's internal conflict between academics and archaeologists. But again, some positives always, I like to try and take some positives, try to be a positive person. Um, intangible heritage kind of had a big play. Oral traditions kind of um, come to the forefront of the conversation. Um, addressing some of those statuses, you know, what is and what, why is there this separation between what's a federally recognized tribe and what's not? Um, and the opportunity, as we're doing right now, hopefully to learn. And these are some of the lawsuits that came about later on about um, from it. I won't go through them, but you can see that they kind of, um, this is the ones related to the Four Oaks that came through. This one was about, because um, they compromised and they, they kind of built around not affecting the spring water um, where it derives from. There's an argument later that it did, so just suits came from this. So go, just going back quickly to uh, review some of the aims of the project. Um, see that, you know, what are the issues? What are the lessons learned? Common themes I've picked up from um, a sort of accusations towards fr from the protesters was the lack of sufficient archaeological investigation could be under question research not as robust as it could be not all um, so that's 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 perhaps referring to the uh, historical mapping um, not all sources considered equal you know who 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 do you talk to which native tribes is it fair to put some above the others um, this one I haven't really mentioned so far in talk but it's about the breadth of the contributors so the EIA was carried out by by um, one um, one per one person. Um, consulting other people as well, but it was still coming down to one person's interpretation of all the information. Um, and, a, and a lack of platform for the voicing opinions, which uh, I saw some of the um, people that were living there, they, when, when, when they were affected by the route, um, the, only, the only opportunity that they could have to voice their opinions, I think, was a four minute um, slot in one night's worth of, um, of, of consultation, which I think was um, very frustrating for them. Um, but then we've got the archaeologist issue, sort of looking at their perspective, they had to follow guidelines and, 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 the, and limitations to, uh, um, so they, they, could, they were kind of bound to that process. Um, they've got this issue of multivocality where there's all these various parties arguing different um, points. Um, the historic landscape assessment, boundary issues, what was Fort Snelling, what was Camp Coldwater, how far does it go, can it be protected? Um, NAGPRA was new, so, that, so the burials um, uh, possibility was, was a bit of an issue at the time. Um, dealing with subjective and biased evidence, how do you deal with intangible evidence and oral traditions? Um, field work's under pressure. When you're doing field work, if you've got people hurling abuse at you, it's probably not too nice. Um, and constant readdressing of the evidence, tiring time, time wasting and money consuming. Um, could they have done more though? But they followed the processes, they consulted the native tri communities, the ten tribes, again following the processes. They were receptive to some compromises. I mentioned they do end up building the, uh, the, the route around the spring water, or at least over it, not affecting where it's deriving from. Um, they generally wanted, uh, archaeologists, like you'd like to think, generally want to preserve things. They're not trying to do it, not trying to be cheeky and avoid things. Um, and they're essentially dealing with quite a tough and diverse crowd. Again, this is quite an extreme example. Um, but likely, as I said, there, there were some um, possible things they could have done to, to, to um, not be in that situation in the first place. Um, never exists in the vacuum, so some of the lessons, you know, remember that 
everything you do affect, affects um, uh, uh, people in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, they could have been a bit more proactive. Uh, I say this, again, going above and beyond, not following, even though that's what the legislation states, if you can, you know, go out and, and then consult uh, the, the people which might have a stakeholder interest in it, but aren't necessarily officially have to be, have to be consulted. Um, identify groups that could be affected, not just the ones the law states could be. Um, more conscious perspectives could be used. So again, that's talking about the breadth of, of, of who's putting in, into that environmental impact assessment. Um, uh, people could become involved when there's lack of information or misinformation. Uh, redefining ambiguous legal terms. This, this good faith effort. Uh, had they done a good faith effort when they did the map regression? You know, did did they really put that effort in to go and find a better example, or did they did they make do with what what was easy at the time? Um, Another lesson, gaps in the, in the oral traditions and histories, as I mentioned, and to provide more archaeological surveys using the benefits of advancing technology. And that's kind of where um, I, want, I wanted to kind of make a point here now as well, at, at the end of this, about, because this was, so, it was quite a while ago now, what we can do. And um, I mean, if we can think about some of the theoretical, philosophical changes and advances uh, in, in the discipline, as well as the technological advances, and how the majority of these items and issues that have arisen could be at least somewhat mitigated by um, some of the uh, advances we have now, like uh, the sampling. You know, we could do targeted excavations. We can say why we're doing them, where we're doing them. We can show it with numerous uh, new data sources, doing geophysical surveys, remote sensing, powerful tools to do uh, spatial analysis and, and heat maps, for example, hyperspectral analysis, um, and, and then communicating that. We can show it through uh, better visualizations and knowledge sharings, um, uh, perhaps you know, over the internet or, or or um, I know at the EMA conference really about talking about proportionate EI is about how we can do um, less paper-based um, results and, and sort of actually visualise it a bit more. Um, and, and then I think one of the main important ones as well is this communication of the legislation and framework. They, they really, I think that was like a really vital point here that they were kind of arguing for it to be protected. And they thought if they got this TCP status that it would, it would just, the, the route would go away. And I don't think that that, that was communicated well enough. Um, and so if we can harness some of these additions and, and advances in the last you know, 10, 20 years, how, how much more efficient we can be with that and, and hopefully avoid situations like this in the future. So um, just a really quick example. Um, when I was doing this research, I freely available data online. Now you can just go to, to, to uh, Minnesota. It's actually, fortunately, one of the advanced states in that it has, for the whole state, um, LIDAR now coverage. And in the urban areas, uh, sub one meter LIDAR coverage, point cloud information you can go in free download it um, you, you, you can um, I did this in a matter of minutes just 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 to see what the camp cold water area um, pulled pulled off and this was um, a few years ago now so it's probably a little bit uh, more efficient and then some use of the um, some satellite imagery um, this is quite a, a unique one by the Asta um, sat uh, Asta camera aboard the or Asta image uh, sorry sensor abo uh, aboard the Terra satellite which um, it's just, it's just one method, like Landsat or anything, that, that, that has a, a specific wavelength that you can pick up anthrosols, which are anthropogenically altered soils. So, um, you know, bringing these into account to, to maybe avoid some of these issues. Um, but, yeah, so I'm trying to make this a positive discussion. I'm trying to show how, we've, how we are now and how that can avoid situations like this um, from costing developer money for costing the field issue, uh, the field and the discipline, um, res um, you know, dignity and respect. So, um, possible avoid in the future um, and advancing existing understanding of the disciplines of your approaches and to help our discipline progress in future um, that's it any questions <laughs>